Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the 15th annual Arsham and Charlotte Oanesian Lecture, uh, which will be delivered in a moment by the renowned historian Timothy Snyder. Uh, I will introduce him a little bit later. My name is Joachim Safelsberg. I'm a holder of the Arsham and Charlotte Oanesian Chair. Uh, I want to acknowledge, first of all, Arsham Ornesian, who many of you do not know. The Ornesian family escaped the Armenian genocide and went to Baghdad, and Arsham made it from Baghdad uh, eventually via the United Kingdom to the United States, and he dedicated much of his uh, fortune to the fight against genocide, the memory of the Armenian genocide, and the fight for peace and for justice. Uh, the members of the board uh, are with us today, and I welcome them particularly. Not with us is Asham's sister, Sita, who has so far never left out uh, one of these occasions, but she is too ill to be with us today, and we wish her a good recovery. I want to acknowledge a few uh, people who made this uh, event possible. Uh, of course, there are are the resources that come with the Oanesian chair, and they are essential. Uh, essential also is the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies and its wonderful director, Alejandro Baer, who is a friend and with whom I enjoy to collaborate. Uh, also contributor is the Center for Austrian Studies. And this is a collaboration we're able to bring uh, Timothy Snyder in here uh, because we collaborated with St. Thomas University and there the J. Phillips Center for Interfaith Learning, the Aquinas Chair for Theology and Philosophy, and the Grants and Research Office. Finally, I should mention the Arsham and Charlotte Ornesian Fund for Justice and Peace Studies of the Minneapolis Foundation. Before I introduce the speakers, I would like to ask our Associate Chair, Anna Paula Ferreira, uh, to come and welcome you. Anna Paula is a great professor of Spanish and Portuguese. She is a trusted dean. Uh, uh, and she is a great supporter of things dealing with genocide, with uh, uh, human rights, and uh, we thank you very much for that, Anna Paula. Please. Thank you, Joaquin. And um, I am representing uh, the dean, um, the leadership of the College of uh, Liberal Arts and it is with pleasure um, that I do so this evening. I'm delighted to be with you today and to welcome you to the University of Minnesota and the College of Liberal Arts for this wonderful lecture. I know that many of you are also here for the symposium that begins tomorrow, Comparative Genocide Studies and the Holocaust, Conflict and Conversions co-organized by the Onisian Chair and the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Thank you for joining us. Your discussions will build an interdisciplinary knowledge base to better understand the causes and effects of mass atrocities, the construction of public remembrance, responses to past and present mass violence, and the prevention of future atrocities. This is critically important work, especially at this time in history. With the recent upsurge in bias crimes on our campus, in our state, and nationwide that have targeted religious, racial, immigrant, and LGBTQ groups and individuals, with an international landscape fraught with tensions around refugees, immigration, and ethnocentrism. Today's lecture and this week's symposium seem especially meaningful and necessary. On our campus, we have a number of research centers and projects committed to academic research, education, and public awareness on genocide and human rights. Among them are CLA's Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, the Human Rights Program, the Human Rights Center, 
and the Human Rights Lab at the law school, the University of Minnesota Human Rights Library, and the program in Human Rights and Health in the School of Public Health. In recent years, faculty from these colleges and schools have established a monthly salon on human rights to discuss its members' work, coordinate resources, and find ways to achieve synergy. CLA has also just created a joint master's program in human rights with the University of Minnesota Humphrey School of Public Affairs. And recently, a group of colleagues between CLA, the law school, and the Humphrey were awarded one of, Provo, of the Provost's Grand Challenges grants. Those resources are being used to set up a human rights lab, advance research, and train graduate students in applied human rights settings in the US and globally. That brings us to today's lecture and the Onesian chair. The goals of this college-wide chair have been to promote academic research among scholars with a theoretical, methodological, and policy interest in human rights, genocide, and public remembrance. The Onesian chairs have come from a wide array of fields throughout CLA, and the Onesian chair's lecture has been given by sociologists, historians, and poets. Tonight, we add Yale University's renowned Holocaust and genocide historian, Timothy Snyder, to our Honesian lectures. Professor Savelsberg will be introducing him shortly, and I can't wait to hear his talk. We can't wait. Lectures like these are vital to fulfilling our promise as a land-grant institution. Not only do they bring together scholars from disparate fields, but they bring the public in on the discussion. We firmly believe that the university must reach out beyond the borders of our campus and live within and contribute to its community, or better, communities. Before I go, I'd like to thank the Honesian family without whom this lecture would not have been possible. The Arsham and Charlotte Honesian lecture results from a generous gift by Arsham Honesian to the College of Liberal Arts. Arsham was a successful businessman, avid musician, and dedicated community leader who was devoted to promoting peaceful reconciliation among peoples. His gift to the University of Minnesota supports a wide range of educational, research, and public programs concerning human rights, ethnic, and national conflicts in Armenian history and culture. Thank you all once again for coming tonight. The College of Liberal Arts, as the home of the humanities and arts and the social sciences, is deeply invested in supporting research excellence, pedagogical innovation, and substantial community engagement in the realm of human rights and remembrance. As I said at the beginning, this work is more important now than ever. And I thank you all for your interest and engagement and for your work and contributions to this field. Thank you, and I'll turn now um, the microphone back to Joaquin. Thank you, Anna Paula. I much appreciate your kind words. Uh, it is now my great pleasure to, and my honor indeed, to introduce to you Professor Timothy Snyder, who is our speaker. I also will introduce to you Professor Emeritus Gary Cohen, who will provide a brief comment after Tim Snyder's speech. Timothy Snyder is the Hossum Professor of History at Yale University and a permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna, Institut für die Wissenschaft von Menschen. Uh, he has earned his doctorate from the University of Oxford in 1997, 
where he was a British Marshall Fellow. He has received many prestigious fellowships. Uh, he is the author of six single author award-winning books, all of which have been translated into multiple languages. I want to mention just three books, Black Earth, The Holocaust as History and Warning from 2015, which will appear in 30 foreign editions, has been a bestseller in four countries, has received multiple distinctions. Bloodlands, Europe between Hitler and Stalin, 2010, which won 12 awards, including a literature award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. And the Hannah Arendt Prize in Political Thought has been translated into 30 plus languages and was named 12 Book of the Year lists. His most recent book is on tyranny, 20 lessons from the 20th century. It's light and small, and thus I brought it along, but it contains a lot a lot of lessons for uh, our contemporary times. Uh, Timothy Snyder also has written for broad audiences in outlets such as the New York Review of Books or Foreign Affairs. He has received so many honors, if I wanted to listen to them, I would use up all of his lecture time. There are great historians and there are public intellectuals, and Timothy Snyder is both. And there are historians and there are those who speak to current affairs and Timothy Snyder does both, and so we are really happy to have you here. The comment will be delivered by Gary B. Cohen, Professor Emeritus of History at the U of M, past director of our Center for Austrian Studies. His research has focused on social development, ethnic group relations and education, modern Austria and the Czech lands. His publications include The Politics of Ethnic Survival, Germans in Prague, 1861 to 1915, which was published by Princeton University Press. Uh, he has as well received many recognitions that I cannot list here. I want to briefly say the order of things. We will listen to Professor Snyder's lecture. We'll listen to brief comments by Professor Cohn. And then we'll open things up to the public, but we will collect cards. I hope they have been, have cards been distributed to you to write down questions. We will collect those after Professor Snyder's lecture. And then uh, Professor Cohn, Professor Snyder, and I will be sitting up here and we will be uh, engaging with the questions that you will have posed. Uh, afterwards, there will be a reception and there will also be in the same room a book signing uh, by Timothy Snyder of the books that will be there on display. And also, he cannot say that, but I can for sale. Um, Without further ado, I welcome Professor Timothy Snyder to de deliver his 15th or the 15th Ornessian lecture entitled The Politics of Mass Killings, Past and Present. Timothy, please come up. Thank you very much for the kind welcome. Thank you for being here and joining me in this discussion. I, I stand before you with two important duties to discharge. On the one hand, it is my responsibility and pleasure to give the annual Ohanasian lecture. In this respect, it is my responsibility to speak about the history of mass killing over the century from the mass killing and expulsion of Armenians to today. It's also my responsibility to open a conference of colleagues from whom I have learned who are here to talk about the Holocaust and the possibility of comparing the Holocaust and other genocides. What I propose to do, ladies and gentlemen, is to discharge these two duties together. What I would like to do in the next 45 minutes or so is present to you an argument, my own argument, my own case, my own causal case for how the Holocaust of the European Jews could happen, but along the way, try to indicate how this kind of interpretation, a focus on causes more than effects, a focus on origins rather than memories, can help us to find commonalities, points where comparisons might be possible. My underlying assumption as an essentially very conservative historian, not necessarily a conservative person, but an essentially conservative historian, is that we may not always fully understand the things that we, need, that we want to compare. 
and that the first step towards a comparison might be an enrichment of our, of our understanding. Let me begin by telling you what I think about comparison as a, as, as, as a fundamental issue before I move into the argument about causes. May we compare the Holocaust of European Jews to other events of genocide? It seems to me to be perfectly obvious that we can. And I will give you two very simple reasons why I believe this to be the case. The first has to do with the logic of comparison. If I stand before you with the lights on me, the microphone on my tie, um, up here on a stage and say, you must not compare the Holocaust and other events, what have I done? I have said nothing more and nothing less than I have made the comparison. I see how it looks. And I would rather you not do the same thing. It's a power claim. Um, taboos on comparison of any kind are essentially power claims. They can't be scholarly. And as scholars, we can't really counsel them. The second point that I would make about comparison from my own work has to do with sources. If one engages with the primary source material of the Holocaust, particularly the abundant, much more abundant than scholars sometimes recognize, source material coming from the victims, from the Jewish victims, one finds that these are rich in comparisons. Not only in the simple sense that Jews naturally compare their fate in 1941 to biblical times, but in the much more robust and interesting sense that Jews compare what is happening to them to what is happening to other people. And because Jews in, the, in Eastern Europe, who were the preponderant group of victims of the Holocaust, because almost all of them experienced Soviet rule, they very often the primary source material, whether it's in Yiddish, Polish, Hebrew, Russian, they very often compare Nazi and Soviet occupation. This is completely normal. When we look for houses on the real estate market, we compare them. A much more serious situation arises when you're deciding when you're going to flee and in what direction. In those situations, you make comparisons. The sources are rich in them. So to impose a taboo on comparison as such between the Holocaust and other events would be essentially to place a taboo retrospectively upon the precious sources that we have left behind from the victims. I propose that, that we not do that. I propose that we start in a different way. How do I propose that we start? What I would like to be able to do um, in this lecture is to give you a sense how the sources, the primary sources, sometimes tell a more interesting story, a surprising story about the causes of the Jewish Holocaust than the one that we perhaps have become accustomed to. Let me, let me begin by, by reading a couple that I find particularly suggestive. Uh, a man called Feldshu, um, who was in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, was describing the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising of April 1943, left behind many pregnant phrases, one of them which stays with me was, people lived in the earth. What he was describing were Germans going from apartment building to apartment building with flamethrowers trying to extract Jews dead or alive from the ghetto during the uprising. But the way that Mr. Feldshu told to chose to describe it was to say, People lived in the earth, it's reference to the earth. Uh, a, a year later, a Hungarian poet, um, uh, Radnoti, who was a forced laborer, who knowing that he was very likely to be killed, kept his poetry in his jacket pocket. And on the notebook in which he kept the poetry, he had a note, I think in six languages, describing what to do when, when his corpse was discovered. So when my body is discovered, please you know, find these poems and publish them. One of those poems that he wrote in, in the weeks before his death contains these lines. I, the root, was once the flower. Under these dim tons, my bower. Comes the shearing of the thread, death saw wailing overhead. Now, what strikes me in both of these passages is, are the references to nature, the references to the earth, which, of course, is not so surprising in one way, because we now know those of us who study the Holocaust, those of us who attend to the history of the Holocaust, we now know that the Holocaust began and ended with pits, that the encounter with the earth, the violent encounter with the earth, was something that Jews um, anticipated in much of Eastern Europe. 
But I think there may be a pro more profound resonance to these sources as well. Sometimes the victims understand things, see things, grasp things intuitively in ways that later scholars might not. And, and, and here I think we have an example of this. I think these words, and one could cite dozens of other examples of, of, these, of these victims, point us back to an important aspect of, of, of the thought of Adolf Hitler, an aspect of his thought which usually goes, I think, unnoticed. And that is the way that Hitler himself thought about the earth. That is the basic fact that Hitler's thinking begins with a concept of, of the earth, with a concept that we might describe as ecological. Now, I don't mean ecological in the positive sense of, you know, of, of, of separating out your recycling and, and being concerned about the environment, important though that is. I mean ecological in the sense that his idea of politics and his notion of anti-Semitism, his enmity towards the Jews, begins with a particular description of the way the earth works or the way the earth is, is supposed to work. And the reason why I believe that this is primary is not just that it's in Mein Kampf, it's the first few pages of Mein Kampf. And it resonates forward in time with so many of the decisions that he made later on. So what is, what is Hitler's view about ecology? How did Hitler see the earth and why does this matter in a discussion of the politics, the politics of, of mass killing? Hitler described the planet as a finite space with finite resources. The way that the world was supposed to work, says Hitler, is that we as races, Hitler thinks we belong to races, we as races should be competing for these limited resources the same way that he believes that species compete for their ecological niches, their Lebensraum. Um, this is the way the world should be. And in such a world, the superior races, he thinks the Germans are probably superior. He's not sure, but he thinks so. The superior races should be winning all the time. So Germans should be controlling Europe, Germans should be moving east, they should be conquering more territory. If this is not happening, there, something must be wrong. And, and the important thing, the interesting thing is at what level something is wrong. Not with politics, not with institutions. Something is wrong with the state of the planet. Something is wrong with us and the way that we behave on the planet. And the thing which is wrong with us, says Hitler, is that we have ideas. We have these ideas which have made us uh, human. We have these ideas which have somehow persuaded us that we are better than animals, which, says Hitler, we're not. Right? This is Hitler's reverse original sin, essentially. We're not better than animals. It's our sin to believe that we are better than animals. And who brought this sinful knowledge to us? Th and this is where the anti-Semitism begins, so this is, and this is why it's so profound. Hitler believes that any idea that persuades you that you are a human dealing with other humans, as opposed to a member of a race who should be competing bloodily with other races, Hitler believes that any such idea is Jewish. Any such idea. So people joke that Hitler thought that the Jews were responsible for capitalism and for communism. In his view, this was not a contradiction, because whether you believe in signing contracts with people you don't know, or whether you believe in working class solidarity with people you don't know, in both cases, you're acknowledging the humanity of others. Hitler believes similarly that Christianity is Jewish. Christian mercy is Jewish. Solidarity is Jewish. Any, any notion which allows us to see humans as humans is, is Jewish. And therefore, from his point of view, and this is, this is very important, from his point of view, it damages the world. It makes the planet what it is not supposed to be. And this is relevant to the specific character of the Holocaust, of course, because if the problem with the whole world is the presence of Jewish ideas, there is only one way to be sure that there will, those ideas will go away. They cannot be defeated by argument. That's Jewish terrain. The only way that, says Hitler, the only way they can be defeated is by the elimination of Jews from the face of the earth. And here at the level of Hitler's thinking, we have also a kind of comparison, or at least an inevitable juxtaposition, because we see that Hitler's thinking about race, Hitler's racism, and Hitler's anti-Semitism are organically connected in the way that he presents the world. Hitler was a racist uh, in the sense that he believed that the world was divided into inferior and superior races. Hitler believed that what should happen is that there should be a great cleansing war in which the, the German race would take what is rightfully its. But what was stopping that war from happening was, as Hitler saw things, 
the world Jewish conspiracy which means that in order, for, in order for the world to be restored into the normal racial struggle, first, at the beginning, there had to be some blow struck against the Jews. So Hitler's racism and Hitler's attitudes about the Jews can't really be separated. And although they're different, they can't really be separated. They're part of one set of ideas. And they're part of one set of ideas in practice as well. These ideas have a kind of territoriality. Because when Hitler thought about land and the land that Germans should control. He had a particular territory in mind. It happened to be Ukraine. And when Hitler thought about why the Germans should be controlling Ukraine, the claim was, we are superior and we're packed into a small country, while these utterly useless vermin um, have access to these immense fertile, uh, immense fertile reaches of black earth. So that's, his view is that Germans naturally should have Ukraine because we're superior and they're inferior. What's stopping that from happening? the existence of the Soviet Union, which Hitler conveniently reasons is a Jewish state. So this isn't just an idea, it's also a battle plan. The way for Germany to become an empire, to become agriculturally self-sufficient, to become a superpower, is to attack what Hitler sees as being a Jewish state. All of this rolls into one. Lebensraum, living space, particularly means Ukraine. Now, why would this Lebensraum idea be political? Perhaps it sounds fantastic to you. Perhaps the notion that races are in conflict is one which seems completely alien to you. Perhaps it seems alien to imagine a struggle for survival. In that sense, we're, we're expressing a certain privilege because it is only in the West and only since about the mid 1950s that food has not been present in politics. And so the fact that I have to make an effort to describe how this kind of politics could be appealing is perhaps a sign of our own exceptional good fortune and not a sign of how unusual Hitler's thinking was. That's first. Second, this becomes politics in a different way. By appealing to emotions which I think will be a little bit closer and you don't have to nod your heads and if you do, don't worry, I'm the only one who's on camera. Um, Lebensraum, mean, living space means, on the one hand, literally the struggle for survival. So the claim is races are like species, there's only so much land, therefore only so much food, therefore there must be endless war. And so and if you don't take part in this endless war, you're starving your children and your grandchildren, you're betraying the race. That's one set of emotions. Another set of emotions goes like this. It says, our people have the right to live and not just survive, but to live as well as everyone else. Who is living now the best in the world, asks Hitler in the 1920s? The Americans. Therefore, we must have land, not just to survive, but to have a living standard that's as good as that of the Americans. And this is, of course, always relative. It's not just about a certain quantity of something. It's about being as good as someone else. And it's subjective. You never really know when you've reached the standard of someone else, so you have to keep struggling. And that, I would submit, is a form of politics which is a little bit less unfamiliar. The idea that someone far away just might have to suffer and die so that I and my family might have a standard of living, whether we recognize that or not, that is much, much closer to home. Um, that's, a, that's a case that Hitler was able to make and that others since Hitler have also been able to make. So this line of politics is, I'm trying to make the point, one causal set of links moving us towards the Holocaust. What, there could not have been a Holocaust without the choice of Germany to invade the Soviet Union. There simply could, there was not until that point, and I would say there could not have been, for the very simple reason that the Jews are on the invasion route to the Soviet Union. Whatever the ideology might have been and whatever the tools to kill Jews might have been, without the banal fact of German armed force progressing eastward, the Holocaust would not have been possible. The links are though a bit tighter than that. Without the attempt to destroy the Soviet Union, not just to fight a conventional war and win it, but the attempt to destroy the Soviet Union, the conditions would not have been present for what we remember as, as, as the Holocaust. Um, and beyond that, the way that the war was fought imitated this struggle for calories. This str that's what they talked about it, by the way. I mean, for us, a calorie is something of which we have too much. Um, for German planners, and generally for political planners in the 30s, this was totally normal. A calorie was something precious of which there wasn't enough. So the way the war was fought in the East 
activated a kind of struggle which, is, which, is a, which echoes the struggle that Hitler thought was normal. German soldiers fighting in the East were told they had to live from the land. That may sound abstract. What that means is they had to secure for themselves all of their food. Not just for themselves, by the way, but for their horses, um, which is something we forget. Even the German war effort in the East in 1941 was primarily horse-driven. So everything that they needed, they had to take from the land, which meant that people, they got used to people around them suffering and dying. The Wehrmacht, as it invaded the Soviet Union, starved to death three million people, deliberately, in camps. Um, this was less than the 30 million that were expected to die in that war, but nevertheless, rather, rather significant. And this is directly related to the Holocaust. How? Because, because food supplies were short, the order was German soldiers, if we have anything left, German civilians, then non-Jewish, then non-Jews, and then Jews. As food supplies became shorter, the argument was made over and over again, it would make more sense to kill the Jews where they are. And this is, in fact, how the Holocaust began. It was one of the arguments for killing Jews. There's no point of feeding people who are going to starve to death anyway. And that was an argument which was made not just in 1941 in the Soviet Union. The next year, in 1942, it was made in Poland. The, the, the center of the Holocaust, the clearing of the Warsaw Ghetto in the summer of 1942, took place after Heinrich Himmler argued that the labor of the Jews in the ghetto was worth less than the calories that we needed to feed them. That's not the only cause, I'll talk about the others, but that's one reason why the Jews were cleared from the Warsaw Ghetto. And when they were cleared from the Warsaw Ghetto in 1942, how were they brought to the gathering point? What is it that enticed them to the gathering point? in summer of 1942 for what the Germans called the Große Aktion. The signs at the very beginning said, bread and marmalade, bread and marmalade, right? which tells you something very profound about the experience. The experience of Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto wasn't just a matter of ideology or hatred or separation. It was also a matter of suffer, perhaps day to day above all, a matter of suffering and hunger, a matter of being at the wrong end of a certain kind of ecology. So although it was obviously a lie that you were going to get bread and jam, people nevertheless came and were taken to Treblinka and were shot and were gassed. The next year, in 1943, when the surviving Jews of Warsaw rose up in April of that month, um, the, the, Mr. Feldshu was one of them, when the surviving Jews of Warsaw rose up, they were defeated by a, a mixed German commando led by a man called Jürgen Stroop. Jürgen Stroop, who was the man who destroyed the Warsaw, what remained of the Warsaw Ghetto, um, killed tens of thousands of Jews, sent the rest to camps. Jürgen Stroop later, um, in a prison cell, with a, very, with a very intelligent person, was induced to talk about why he thought, why he, what, what he thought about when he was doing that. What were you thinking about when you brought those flamethrowers from basement to basement? And the answer was, I was thinking about the milk and honey of Ukraine the milk and honey of Ukraine. Even at that point in 1943, even when committing so immediate an atrocity hundreds of miles away from Ukraine, the thought was, this is about transforming ecology. This is about making Germany prosperous. So right down to that level, this idea of ecology is one of, is one of the sources of the Holocaust. Let me now, if I can, introduce uh, a second source and uh, a, a, second, a second line of analysis. The first line of analysis has to do with ecology. The second line of analysis has to do with the state, but not, not perhaps in the way that we're used to. I'm not going to be telling you about how the German state prosecuted its Jews step by step until they were killed, because that's not how the Holocaust happened. I'm going to tell you a, a different, I'm trying to make a different sort of argument about how states can transform themselves into unusual kinds of institutions, about how states can destroy or warp or fundamentally transform other states in ways that make mass killing possible. I'd like to start with the story of a young Polish Jewish woman whose name was Irena Lipschitz. So Irena, 1939. September of 1939, Germany invades Poland. The 1st of September 1939, Germany invades Poland from the west. Hundreds of thousands of people flee to the east. About a quarter of a million of these people were Jews. About 250,000 Polish Jews flee to the east. Where do they think they are running to? They think they are running to the eastern half of their own country. 
they arrive, they generally pick um, a, a small town or a settlement, um, a shtetl we would say, and they're helped by the local Jewish community. But they're not in their own country for very long because on the 17th of September, 1941, 1939, I'm sorry, sorry, when you text it distracts me, thank you. Because um, I mean, you're not looking at me, but I'm looking at you and I'm looking at you texting and it makes me upset. Um, the, uh, the, the, uh, on the 17th of September, 19, 1939, um, the Soviet Union invades Poland from the east, which means that all of, the, all of the local Jews of eastern Poland, a little bit more than a million, and all these refugees, a couple hundred thousand, are now suddenly under Soviet rule. Then, uh, a little less than two years under that, after that, June, 19, June 1941, the Wehrmacht invades the Soviet Union. By invading the Soviet Union, what is it really invading? It's invading Eastern Poland, which has just been invaded by the Soviet Union. It's very important. So, Irena, all these refugees, all these local Polish Jews are now under German rule. And not long after that, in fact, not long, not far from where, from where Irena herself had been, had taken shelter, the Holocaust of Jews begins. It ends in a little town called Wisotsk, not even a town, a village. It's on the edge of the Polesian marshes, which is now in northwestern Ukraine, south, southwestern, southwestern Belarus. In, when, when, the, when the Germans, with local helpers, come to murder the Jews of her community, this is now September of 1942, she runs into the swamps. Now, Irena is um, a city girl. She's not someone who spent a lot of time in the countryside. This comes clear from the source that I'll tell you about later. She spends a few days trying to survive on berries and mushrooms, realizes she can't do this, and says, OK, I will go out to the nearest road, and I will ask the first person who comes by for help. She does this. Uh, the first person, so she, she stands on a path. It wouldn't be really a road. In Polesia, there weren't really roads. There were muddy tracks, um, it, it, which most, much of the year were impassable. She stood out on the path. She put out her hand out and waited. And a man emerged over the horizon. She waited for him. As he got closer, she could see that it was a young man, very well built, with a double-barreled shotgun over his shoulder. Nevertheless, she waited, and she asked him for help. Now, in this story, we are right in the middle of the Holocaust. Irena was precisely a typical victim of the Holocaust. The, the considerable majority of, of victims of the Holocaust were Polish Jews, like her. The second largest group of victims in, in, the, in the Jewish Holocaust were Soviet Jews, people with whom Irena joined her destiny when she fled to the East. The way the Holocaust took place in the beginning and also throughout was by way of shootings. Her particular situation as a Jew literally trying to survive from the earth, right, from, from berries and mushrooms, was exactly what Hitler himself fantasized about in Mein Kampf. He fantasized about creating a world in which Jews could no longer survive by their wits or by their skills or by what we might consider to be normal life, but would be forced into a situation of natural struggle where they would have no choice except to try to live from the land. This was Hitler's fantasy, and here we see it literalized. We're also, but we're far away from certain things too. I'm saying this is typical, but we're very far away from the usual images we might associate with the Holocaust. We're far away from Germany, just in space. There aren't any Germans around, you know, once Irena's hiding at least, and there aren't very many Germans around at, at all. We're certainly far away from the, the notion of a machine, a killing machine say at Auschwitz. Auschwitz at this point is not yet a killing center, and of course more people will be shot than will die at Auschwitz. We're very part away from some notion of some kind of efficient bureaucracy. The vast majority of victims in the Holocaust are not going to be counted by anybody before they're killed. Bureaucracy in that sense is not going to be involved. We're also far away from the way that we usually explain the Holocaust when we have another way of explaining it. We're very far away from the nation. So, very often it happens once we get out away from Germany and we're not sure what to say about the state. We fall back upon ethnic prejudice as an example. We talk about how the Lithuanians were the worst or the Latvians or the Belarusians or the Russians or the Crimean Tatars or the local Germans or whoever it might be. The evidence suggests that people, regardless of ethnicity, behaved in pretty much the same way or differently. The, the best way to predict how people would behave had nothing to do with their ethnicity but, and much to do with the particular political local 
circumstances. But my point here is a, is a much broader one or a simpler one. How are we exactly doing, if, we, if we're going to fall back on ethnicity, how would we do it here? Who is Irena? She's a Jew. She doesn't speak any Jewish languages, though. She speaks Polish. She went to a place in eastern Poland where the Jews around her spoke Yiddish, but they were surrounded by peasants who spoke Ukrainian or Belarusian, depending upon whether you're Ukrainian or Belarusian. Looking back at the situation, they actually spoke dialects somewhere in between. She was in a place which was governed by people who, who spoke Polish and then was governed by people that spoke Russian and then was governed by people that spoke German all at once. Oh, and by the way, in the Polesian marshes, famously or notoriously, depending on whether you're a nationalist or not, this was the place in Europe where people refused to define themselves nationally and when asked by census takers said, we're from here. So how exactly in that situation are we going to use ethnicity to explain what happens to Edena? The case that I want to try to make here is that although we're far away from our familiar images, um, we're close to the way Hitler saw the world, and that's a useful clue. And we're also close to something else, which is more interesting, if we're talking about comparison. We're very close to the way that most social scientists actually describe episodes of mass killing. So social scientists in the last 25 years, basically since Srebrenica, since the ethnic cleansing in Yugoslavia, have made ethnic cleansing, genocide, mass killing, um, terms of art, they've tried to explain them. They use methods that are very different than mine, methods very different than historians. Um, they've done dozens, actually hundreds of studies of contemporary cases and past cases. They've done studies of studies. And the interesting major finding, and there are people in this audience who, who know more about this than me and have done this research, the interesting finding of social scientists, what I find interesting anyway, is that the strongest correlation is not bet between, with mass killing, is not the strong state. The strongest correlation is the weak state, the collapsing state, the failed state, the state in civil war, the state that's being destroyed by some other state. So when we look at cases of killing in general, that's the major association people find. So here we have a point of comparison, but here's also where things get interesting. Because, because the question arises, well then, how is Nazi Germany unique? We may have, we have a strong intuition, I think many of us said there's something special about the Nazi case, I certainly do. How, how, how would we justify the intuition? And here the historians come into play and are very helpful. This, because what is the job description of a historian? The job description of a historian is to say, yes, social scientists, you have thousands of examples and you've used sophisticated methods which I don't understand. But I'm nevertheless not convinced because I know a counterexample. And I have lots of detail about it. That's the job description of a historian. Um, and I'm now going to do that. So historians say, but wait, we know exceptions. We know some cases where without state destruction, without instability of the state, there was mass murder. And those exceptions are, the major exceptions are Cambodia, People's Republic of China, and the Soviet Union. Now what's interesting about those exceptions, again, is that those exceptions are all party states. Those, are all, those exceptions are all states where, where are all political regimes where the party, it happens to be the Communist Party, but it doesn't have to be, the, the, where the party is more important than the state, where the most important relationship between the individual and power is not to the state, to the law, but to the party. Why am I dwelling on all this? Why am I going back and forth from social scientists and historians? Because this helps us understand what's actually unique about Nazi Germany. What's unique about Nazi Germany is not the way that it stands outside history and is therefore impossible to understand. What's unique about Nazi Germany is the way that it actually confirms, uniquely confirms, everything that the two major currents of scholarship of mass killing say. One major current says it's the failure of the state. The other major current says, no, it's the party state. What is Nazi Germany uniquely? Uniquely, Nazi Germany is a party state the ideology of the party of which is, we should destroy other states. The way that the Holocaust can happen is that uniquely there is a party state that goes out into the world, particularly into Eastern Europe, particularly in that place which is supposed to be Lebensraum, and tries to destroy other states. And in that environment, something like a Holocaust is possible. So if we're going to think about this as politics, it's not chiefly uh, and it's not only, but it's not even chiefly 
the normal story of Hitler coming to power, which is, of course, extremely important. It's very important that when we, when we all should all remember, particularly now, that Hitler did very well in elections. His party won, although he was outnumbered by the left. We should remember that um, despite the fond hopes of conservatives and nationalists, um, he was very hard to control. We should remember that there was a Reichstag fire, a moment of terrorism, which allowed him to slip from a republic into an authoritarian regime. These things are all very important. But when we move from there, from the regime change to the Holocaust, there's something else which I think is very interesting, and that's the survival of the SS. I say survival, why? Because the SS is not a police force. The SS is not part of the state. The SS began as a security detail, um, which protected Hitler at his rallies and threw people out when they tried to protest. Um, the, the, the SS, but what's interesting, is that the SS remained, the SI and the SS, remain as non-state organs of violence after 1933. This is a little bit unusual because usually when you, see the thing is, you know, if you're planning to carry out a coup d'etat, in general after a coup d'etat, you then subordinate all of your various ruffians and gangs and paramilitaries under the state and you're in charge of the state. That's not what Hitler did. And this is very, this is very, this is very significant because what it means is that aside from the German army and the German police, the conventional organs of violence, there was also an unconventional organ of violence which wasn't meant to follow the rules or the laws. On the contrary, it was precisely the institution which was animated by this anti-political, anti-state racial ideology. The people who thought ecologically in the sense that I was trying to describe before. Inside Nazi Germany, they ran the concentration camps, which were fairly small on a world scale and compared to you know, Germany and Africa or uh, other places, they're not particularly impressive. But compared to the Soviet Union, not impressive at all. But what's interesting about them is that a concentration camp, as all the American lawyers in the audience will know, is by definition a place where there is no law. So the SS was in charge of those things. And then when Germany invades countries in Eastern Europe, the SS become the state destroyers. They become the implementers, the people who believe in something like what other people in other contexts call creative destruction. They're the people who believe that if you clear out the institutions of states, things will be possible that weren't possible before. And of course, they're right. How do we see how they're right? To see how they're right, we have to pay attention to the years 1938 to 1941, years that we often get jumped over, I think, for understandable reasons in the history of the Holocaust. We move quickly from a story of how Hitler came to power to a story of how Germans were, 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 were killing people. There's an important missing part, which is 1938 to 1941. And when I say it's missing, I mean this quite seriously. Look, like, look in your favorite book of the Holocaust, which I'm sure you brought with you, um, in the index, and look up the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and see how many mentions of it there are, right? It will be likely be zero or, or, or one, which, which is extraordinary. The, the moment, why is it extraordinary? The, the, the moment from 1938 to 1941 is the moment when the entire European order is destroyed. Between 1938 and 1941, six European states are removed from the map, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, completely destroyed either by the Germans or by the, or by the Soviets or by the Germans and Soviets together. This is significant because it is, in, it is as German power moves beyond what are still the confines of the German state. The German state, changed though it is, st still imposes certain restrictions. It's when German power, German racial power, German ideological power moves beyond the confines of Germany that lessons are learned about how mass killing will actually be possible. So when Austria f is, is absorbed into Germany in March of 1938, Austrian Jews suffer more in six weeks than German Jews had suffered in six years. Why? There was no progression of anti-Semitic law in Austria like there was in Germany. But Austria ceased to exist, which meant Austrian Jews lost their citizenship, which meant that you could do things to them, and you would do things to them that you wouldn't otherwise. Because one of the iron laws, and there are a few of them in history, um, uh, and, and few of them are as serious as this, one of the iron laws of history is that if, one, if, if everyone loses citizenship, then some majority will turn on some minority. And in this case, when it was clear which minority was supposed to be the victims, that is exactly how people behaved. Czechoslovakia is destroyed in 1939. Like with Austria, if we remember Czechoslovakia at all, we think of Munich, we think of the Czechoslovak state, we think of the betrayal at Munich. The Czechs are obliged to refer to this as drada, okay, it was betrayal, we're guilty. But from the point of view of the citizens of Czechoslovakia, what's interesting is that when the state was destroyed, then Jews were particularly vulnerable. I mean, vulnerable in specific ways that we can describe. 
So when, an, when a newly sovereign Slovakia is created, if you create a new state of an old state, that means there's a moment when everyone floats free of citizenship. And in that moment, you can then just define very quickly a group of second-class citizens. Um, you know, in Germany itself, it takes years to work this out. In Slovakia, it takes a day. It takes a day to describe the Slovaks as second-class citizens who don't, for example, have property rights. And if they don't have property rights, they can't have businesses. And if they can't have businesses, they quickly become immiserated. And if they quickly become immiserated, they, they start to look like a burden. And then the government can say, why must we deal with this burden? Why can't we send them somewhere else? And German negotiators can come and say, yes, indeed, there's a place where you can send them, and that place is called Auschwitz. Or the Jews of the far east of Czechoslovakia, in a part of Czechoslovakia which is joined to Hungary, they are never given citizenship of any kind, not even second-class citizenship. And by no coincidence, those are the Jews who will be killed in the first mass shooting in the Holocaust, and indeed the first mass shooting in the history of the world. Poland, 1939, Germany invades with the explicit object of destroying the state. Um, it removes Jews from all civil protection. There's no Polish state. They're very explicit about this. The Einsatzgruppen move in and start to kill Polish elites. Jews are placed into ghettos. But in all of these cases, and now we're moving to the end, here's what's interesting. The Holocaust doesn't happen right away, and it doesn't happen where people live, at least not where they live right away. Austria is absorbed in Germany in 1938. Its Jews are killed in 1941 and 1942 in Minsk. Minsk. Those Czechoslovak Jews from the far east of Czechoslovakia, they're not killed in 1939. They're killed in 1941, and they're killed in Kamyanets Podilski which is in Western Ukraine. Why? Why in Western Ukraine? Why later? Even the Polish Jews, when they're put into ghettos in 1940, that doesn't mean they're going to be killed right away. I mean, they die horribly of malnourishment, of disease, but they're going to be killed in 1942. Why? Why, Why two years later? And the answer is, the Holocaust can't begin until these two arguments come together. The Holocaust can't begin until Germany begins the invasion of the Soviet Union, until German forces move into those lands that this, where the Soviet Union had already destroyed the state, where German forces try to move towards Ukraine and conquer what they see as the Ukrainian breadbasket, the Ukrainian land of milk and honey. When that war is underway, when German forces start to kill Jews themselves, then all sorts of politics make the continuation of the Holocaust possible. For example, in the Baltic states, where the Holocaust begins, Germans find that there are many local people who are willing to collaborate. Many of them, quite possibly, I think probably most of them, were men who had just been collaborating with the Soviet regime, for whom collaboration with the Germans was a way to remove the stain of collaboration with the Soviets. That's the po special politics of state destruction, or double collaboration. As the Holocaust continues in Belarus or Ukraine, one sees much the same thing. Um, as the Holocaust moves into Poland, one also sees in a different way the consequences of the prior state destruction. It's not just that the Jews are already in ghettos, which is a result of state destruction. It's also features like this. Who was the Judenrat? Right? The, the Jews, the Jewish councils who decided which Jews would be sent earlier and which Jews would be sent later to die in gas chambers, and they did know fairly soon that that's what it was all about. Who were these people who made these terrible decisions? They were the same men and quite literally the same men who had been in charge of interwar Jewish autonomous councils in independent Poland. The people who had been in charge of decisions about kashrut and about, about burial and about weddings, all the things which were given by the Polish central state to local Jewish communal authorities to decide. In that situation, the men behaved one way. In a different situation, they behaved very differently. Something similar is true of the Polish police. The Polish police guarded those ghettos the Polish police were among the forces that made sure that Jews went from ghettos to gas chambers. That's what they did in 1942. In 1943, Polish policemen were chasing down Jews in the countryside so that they could be killed. But if you go back five years or six years to 1938, what were those Polish policemen doing? Those same men are standing at the corners of Jewish market towns preventing pogroms. <laughs> Preventing pogroms, because in the bourgeois rule of law, although flawed and authoritarian Polish state, a pogrom was a violation of property rights. A pogrom disrupted the market economy. You didn't want pogroms. So the, the, the police only oh, took bribes, of course, you know, like policemen will. Um, but the point is that the same institution behaves very differently when the state is removed. So there's a politics to the destruction of the state at the highest level 
where Germany says these states don't exist, these are just our colonial subjects, and so on. But also at the lower levels, the way people behave when the, the, the top levels are removed and when citizenship is no longer, no longer a category. Now, what does this mean for, for, for survival and, and, and what does this mean for us? What I've tried to describe to you in bringing together these two arguments about ecology and state destruction is how the Holocaust began. But what's interesting is that the Holocaust with time, it actually slowed down. Uh, at least in certain parts of Europe, it, it slowed down. In certain parts of Europe, it proved much harder to carry out than in other parts. And this too helps us understand how important the state was. If you were a Jew where the state was destroyed, or to be precise about this, where the German aspiration was to destroy the state, your chances of survival were one in 20. If you were a Jew in all the other places where there was a state, albeit a German state, a German ally, um, an occupied state, your chances of survival were about one in two, which is much worse than one in 20, but I mean, sorry, which is much better than one in 20, still awful, but enough different from one in 20, a factor of 10, that it's worth thinking about. And there's a reason for this, which I'll try to get, get across to you in a couple of ways. One is that the Germans couldn't redo the occupation. So they invaded Poland, they invaded the Soviet Union with the explicit aspiration of destroying the state. They just didn't invade France that way. And so in 1942 came around and the general policy was to destroy all Jews under German control. They couldn't, as it were, redo the invasion of France to create the political conditions they created in Poland and the Soviet Union. That's one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it is now to think positively about institutions. Now, I'm going to be talking to you about flawed institutions, imperfect institutions. I'm just going to be making the point that there's a difference between flawed, imperfect institutions and the complete lack of institutions or warped institutions. So, what are institutions in this sense? Citizenship is an institution, right? You cannot be a citizen unless there's a state that claims you as, I mean, much as we might like to have our passports, if there is no state that recognizes you as a citizen, you're not a citizen of anything. This is crucial for the survival of Jews. For a Jew to be killed, first the citizenship had to go away. The easiest way for the citizenship to go away was for Germany to declare that the state didn't exist. Then citizenship disappeared on the scale of tens of millions at a time. But when Germany had to deal with other states, even allies, it had to first make sure that those allies were not claiming Jews as its citizens, which slowed down the process quite considerably. And it also meant, here's another institution, foreign policy. It also meant that people could change their minds. So in places like France or Romania, because there were foreign ministries, because people's ideas about how the war was going might change, policies towards Jews could change. It's a very simple thing, but if there's no state, there's no foreign policy, there's no one there who's looking at the world and thinking now might be a good time to stop killing Jews. A third way to look at this is to, is to consider comparisons at a smaller scale. How about Romania versus Romania? In the, in the parts of Romania where sovereignty changed hands, 94% of the Jews died. In the parts of Romania where sovereignty didn't change hands, most of the Jews survived. Bulgarians often boast that there was no Holocaust in Bulgaria. Not quite true. In the parts of Bulgaria where territory didn't change hands, yes, Jews, didn't, Jews were not killed. They were persecuted, by the way. They were expelled from the capital, but they were not killed. In, in the territories, though, that Bulgaria gained from other places, in other words, where there was that moment where sovereignty floated free, in those places, um, almost all the Jews were sent to German-occupied territories and, and killed. These kinds of comparisons can go on indefinitely, and they're very interesting. Estonia, which was subject to a double, a double occupation, 99% of the Jews were killed. In Denmark, which was subject to the most straightforward and conventional and frankly gentlest of the German occupations, 99% of the Jews survived. You can think, if you want, that this is because the Danes are nice and the Estonians are not. But there's not a whole lot of evidence before 1941, let's say, which would support that view. Admittedly, if you're Danish, it's, it's a good story to tell, right? And we can talk more about the Danish story if you want. Um, but the, the, the basic difference has to do with institutions. I'm going to give you one more comparison, and then we'll be done. Who dies in the French Holocaust? You know, you might think French Jews, OK. But the French Jews are not the biggest victim group in the French Holocaust. The biggest victim group in the French Holocaust are Polish Jews, refugees. Why? Because there's no state behind them. For a French Jew to be killed, the French state has to first agree that this person is no longer a citizen. 
for a Polish Jew to be killed, there's no such mediation. There's no Polish state as far as Germans are concerned. So more, I don't mean in proportional terms, I mean in absolute terms, more Polish refugee Jews or immigrant Jews are killed in the French Holocaust than, than French Jews. And although Polish anti-Semitism is a major and real thing in the interwar world, one just cannot say that Polish Jews died in France because of Polish anti-Semitism. It has to do with the institutional difference. So what does this mean for us? What does this mean for the idea of, of, of rescue? What does this mean for, for the future? It means, and I'm just gonna make this point very quickly, and it seems to me to be a timely point, it means that the rescuers are not always who we think they are. So who were the main rescuers? The main rescuers um, in the Holocaust wore suits and ties. The main rescuers in the Holocaust, pretty much everybody who rescued more than 100 Jews was a diplomat, somebody who sat behind a desk, a paper pusher, a bureaucrat, right? Why? Because diplomats had the almost magical power in the circumstances to give somebody a piece of paper which reconnected that Jew to a state. Travel papers, whatever it might be. Could, diplomats could extend protection that way. That, that's how more Jews were saved than any other way. And that's just the final piece of evidence I want to, I want to deploy to suggest to you that the state was, in the story is extremely important. Okay, what does this all mean for, for us? What I've tried to do as I've made this argument, these two arguments about, about ecology and about state destruction, is to bring in ideology, but in, but in an unexpected way. As I've been talking about econo ecological panic or ecological stress or ecological competition, I've been trying to describe how Hitler saw that as the natural state of affairs. That was his ideology. With the state, it's much the same. Hitler was not a nationalist. He was not convinced that Germany was better than everyone else. As far as Hitler was concerned, it was all a matter of a natural competition, which would begin as soon as we got the Jews out of the way. Um, and then, of course, when Germany lost the war, he said, this is what nature has decided, which is not, by the way, what a nationalist would say. Um, he said, well, it turns out that the Russians were stronger than we were. Um, that's the, what the experiment has proven, so much the worse for us, which is not what a nationalist would, would say. In Mein Kampf, Hitler's attitude towards the state is actually rather hostile. He's not an authoritarian. He's not someone who thinks that we should just hold on to the state and make it more strong or oppressive. He's someone who state, says, in Mein Kampf, states come and they go. The, 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 greatest, the greatest goal of the race is not the creation of a state. A state is one more instrument that we use among others. So in describing to you these causes of the Holocaust, I've also been trying indirectly to give you a sense of ideology. And my conclusion is this, that if we want, if we want to make a causal argument about the Holocaust, it involves those three parts, the ecology, the state destruction, and the ideology. What this means for um, comparison, if you want, or for consideration of other cases, is that if you were going to get an event like the Holocaust, you would need all three. But one could also have terrible events, cases of ethnic cleansing or mass killing, where one of these causes was present, or where two of these causes were present. So for example, looking back now before the Holocaust, the ethnic cleansing that was associated with the Balkan Wars has to do with the end of the Ottoman state, as does the mass murder of Armenians um, in the eastern reaches of what's now Turkey in the middle of the First World War. It's not the only cause, but it's one of the causes. If one looks to events after the Second World War, the end of the Yugoslav state has everything to do with ethnic cleansing in the Balkans. Ecological panic and threats to the state have a good deal to do with the mass killing in Rwanda. Ecological panic has a great deal to do with Sudan. And if we wish to consider Syria today, we have unfortunately almost everything present. We have the destruction of states. Uh, first, the American decision to dismantle the Iraqi state, which led to around two million immigrants to Syria. Then in addition to that, we have ecology. We have the way that global warming did away with the thing which we once beautifully called the Fertile Crescent and thereby drove another couple million internal migrants from the Syrian countryside to the Syrian city. These are not the only causes of the war in Syria, but they are certainly necessary causes. And if we understand the Holocaust broadly, these are causes that we see. Now, those are sadly relatively small scale events compared to the kinds of things that could happen if major states took on Hitlerian ideologies, gave way to ecological panic, and destroyed other states. That is the dreadful combination one has to look out for. And unfortunately, in today's world, 
one can see, I'm not saying that today is 1942 or even 1933, but one can certainly see in today's world certain threatening outlines. So for example, the fact that China, which like Germany, is a major export economy, which can't feed itself, and which in addition to that, unlike Germany, also doesn't have enough water. The fact that China has a notion of where it can get its land, um, its, its fertile territory, which is East Africa, I find that a bit concerning. The fact that Russia, in prosecuting the war in Ukraine, declares that, and I think this was massively under-noticed, declares that the reason that it, would, should, it was legitimate to fight a war in Ukraine was that the Ukrainian state did not really exist strikes me as a worrying sign that we missed. The fact that Russia is hostile to the existence of the European Union, which is basically an institution that props up statehood, whatever its opponents might say, also seems to me to be a serious cause for concern. The fact that we here in the United States have a propensity to deny the science of climate change is even more, I think, frightening than it seems. I mean, if you, if you happen to believe in the climate, and the, the whole climate security field exists to show this, if you happen to believe that climate change makes conflict more likely, that's bad enough. But consider this. When Hitler was making his case for invading Eastern Europe, do you know what he said? He said, the science is not true. He said, the irrigation, the hybridization, all the agronomical science that was being developed here, among other places, um, all the agronomical science doesn't work. Science can't help us. Science will never produce more food. He dismisses all of that. In some of the least cited passages of Mein Kampf, but in my view, some of the key ones, he says, science won't work, therefore we have to have war. We are just a tiny bit closer to that in this country than makes me really comfortable, right? And what does it mean that in this country, again, we are, uh, we have a, an odd, at least at some levels of leadership, nostalgia for the 1930s, with our open references, for example, to America First, which was precisely the idea that one should not resist Nazi Germany. So here we are. Let me close with a notion of what I think about rescue. So if you remember Irena Lipschitz, we left Irena asking for help. The man is approaching her. He gets closer. She sees he has the shotgun. She asks for help anyway. The interesting thing is that he says, yes. He helps her, he gives her shelter, he gives her food, she survives the war, she leaves behind the testimony which I can cite to, to describe to you her, her, her life and her brush with, with death. Now, what's, what's interesting about this person, okay, so he was a, he was a smuggler um, and he was a moonshiner and he was an anarchist and he had scorn for all forms of the state. Under Poland, he rescued communists. When the Soviets came, he rescued Poles. When the Germans came, he rescued Jews. This was generally his idea about how to live. I have a, I have a dear friend who's an, who's an ethicist, who's a professional philosopher, who, went, who read this book for me and when he got to this passage about this fellow he wrote on the margin, he didn't write much, mostly he just like corrects my spelling errors and adds commas. But when he got to this part, he wrote on the margin, I want to party with this guy. <laughs> and that's, I think, an articulation of an impulse that we all have. We want to think, well, yeah, I would like to be with this. I would like to be like that person. But what's unusual about that person is that precisely the destruction of the state didn't matter to him. And what was unusual about him was that he could defy ecology. He was at home in the swamp. That's where he lived. He was fine. He could make his own way. He was exceptional. Rescue of that kind is precisely exceptional. That's what the whole weight of the history of the Holocaust tells us. And what that means is that if we want rescue to be meaningful as a category, it has to not be a Hollywood type category where we wait till the last minute and then do something. It has to be exactly the opposite because unfortunately, if we get to the last minute, it's the last minute, right? Most of us will not rescue when we're in that type of situation. The whole notion, the very American notion, by the way, that we wait till the last minute and then we'll think of something um, is exactly, I think, in this case, wrong. What rescue has to mean is recognizing the Holocaust and other episodes of mass killing as having causal structures and thinking about in advance supporting the kinds of institutions um, and the kinds of policies which will prevent the last moment from actually coming. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.
Thank, thank you, Timothy, very much for your, for your inspiring talk. Before I ask Gary Cohen to come up and speak to us, and he tells me he will speak for not more than 10 minutes, I uh, just want to make sure that questions you, that you have written down will be passed to the aisle, and volunteers will pick them up and bring them down here so we can organize them and respond, or have Timothy and Gary respond to them later. Uh, please, Gary Cohen, come up. Uh, thank you, Joachim. It's a particular privilege and pleasure uh, to uh, be asked to give a response uh, to Tim Snyder uh, tonight, and I do promise to keep it uh, within 10 minutes. I must begin on a personal note, however. I know that there are many graduate students here, and perhaps undergraduates who are thinking about graduate school. I first met Tim uh, sometime in the late 1990s at the big annual convention of the big Slavic Studies Association. Tim, who's from Ohio originally, was back from Oxford having finished his degree, but having been in Oxford and not in the US, so not altogether well connected, uh, and looking for a job. And in fact, it took him several years to get a uh, long-term appointment. Uh, the job at Yale eventually was that long-term appointment where he's been uh, ever since. Uh, he was supported on fellowships and adjunct appointments in the meantime. There's a lesson there. I mean, the job market was very bad for a, new, a newly minted European historian, certainly people interested in East Central Europe, Eastern Europe at the time, and it's not Tim's fault that it took a while to get a job. Uh, but Tim had in his briefcase a really first-class dissertation, made a great first book. He persisted. He hung on. He taught. He wrote. Learned some more languages. Extended his research. Uh, and virtue, in this case, was rewarded. Of course, he's continued to pay his dues all along and written a series of important books. And uh, if you like what you heard tonight or what you may read in Black Earth, uh, I recommend uh, his earlier writings. Uh, Tim tonight took us on quite a ride, uh, giving us uh, a very good uh, summary of important parts of the arguments uh, of his book, uh, Black Earth. And I won't try to summarize all of it or comment on all of it. Now, as a work of synthesis, many of the pieces here uh, are, in fact, as individual nuggets, individual elements, familiar uh, to anyone who's read something about uh, the Holocaust and Nazi Germany. That Hitler saw history as a, as a long process of racial struggle. Uh, uh, with uh, racially determined outcomes, I think we know that Hitler saw uh, the German people needing new additional living space, uh, I think we understood as well. The concept of Lebensraum is in virtually any book on Nazi Germany and Hitler. What Tim Snyder has done in the current work is give a new salience to what living space meant and what was at stake uh, for Hitler in his vision of the world, and that is what goes on in that space, what the space would yield, the resources, the ability to produce more food, to support a larger German folk, and the imperative to take that space to root out the people who lived there, and in the process, if it was to be to the east of Germany, uh, to take the opportunity uh, to destroy the most nefarious elements on the face of the earth, uh, the Jews, the great mass of the European Jews living in Poland and the Western Soviet Union. So there's a new element here, or a new salience that he gives to that, what he calls ecological argument. And of course, it has ramifications and relevance for us uh, today. He goes on to argue uh, that the best means that the Nazis found to achieve their goals in the most radical form was to destroy the state structures, the framework of law, of regulations, uh, of administration, 
of the states that they conquered in Eastern Europe. And where they did that most successfully, uh, they murdered the greatest number of people. First of all, the Jews, but don't forget that three million Poles died as a result of the Nazi and Soviet invasions. If the Nazis had won the war, uh, more, uh, not only would they have wiped out all the Jews, but they would have uh, reduced radically the Polish uh, and Soviet uh, non-Jewish populations. Now, the vision we get of Hitler's ideology here is a fairly static one. It's a fairly monolithic one. And in many ways, that's fair uh, as a characterization of Hitler's core beliefs. What wasn't static were the notions of means, of methods, of how and when uh, to do certain things, uh, or even how to achieve certain goals. And Tim Snyder is well aware of that, and there's some lengthy sections in the book about Hitler's hopes that Poland would ally with Nazi Germany against the Soviet Union. And when that didn't prove possible, then Poland becomes a target of attack. And you can go on that way. What we didn't hear about tonight, uh, which is mentioned briefly in the book, is that while Hitler's grand vision of a planet without Jews uh, was intimated certainly in Mein Kampf that there was an intention uh, uh, for extermination. Uh, the early stages of Nazi policy talked first of all about removal. Now removal also always meant radical reduction of the population. That if you deport them to eastern Poland or into uh, uh, central Russia, they're going to die out there. Or if you send them to Madagascar, certainly they'll die there. Uh, but there's no vision of of mass gassings and death factories uh, till later on. And of course, the actual implementation uh, of the mass killing uh, doesn't, uh, I mean, there's sporadic murders by the Einsatzgruppen in 39 of Polish elite and uh, elements and, and, and uh, Polish Jews. Uh, there's more just as soon as they uh, march into the Soviet Union in 41, uh, but the really massive uh, 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 mass killings uh, really don't get going till the autumn, late August, early autumn of 42. And of course, the actual formal planning of how to carry out the whole thing doesn't actually, uh, as far as we know, take place until after it started. The Vanze Conference doesn't take place till January of 1942. So while there's this monolithic view of the ideology, uh, there is a improvised character of the tactics uh, and methods. Uh, and I warn you, while, while Black Earth is a engrossing read, it is written with great power, great conviction, great clarity. He pulls together all these strands, and it's a virtuoso performance. Uh, be careful with some of the rhetoric. Uh, because some of the key concepts here, I would argue, need a bit more nuance. They need more shades of gray. This notion of destroying the state. Well, yes, of course, if you're going to conquer a territory, uproot the people, kill off the Jews, strip the resources, uh, the best way to achieve that is to, up, to destroy the state that administered that territory first. Yes, the SS was, was, was uh, uh, stitched on to the German state. It was a party creation. It obeyed its own rules, but it was not without its own rules. It was a bureaucratic institution. It had had its own rules and regulations. It was not the embodiment of anarchy. Uh, and I don't think that kind of argument works uh, very well. Uh, if you like, it was a state. Even if Hitler was ambivalent about states and he could improvise as he chose, he took over the German state. He distorted it. He ultimately perverted it, but he used it with the add-ons of the Gestapo, the add-on of the SS. He used that to launch this war of endless destruction, to uproot other states, to occupy those uh, in Western Europe, uh, to weaken their structures and their laws, but he did not thoroughly destroy the German state. 
Now, this gets us to an argument. I mean, he does in the end through a disastrous war, but that wasn't his intention, uh, clearly. This gets us uh, to an argument that comes up, or a, an attempt to dismiss some counterarguments that come up late in the book. And that is arguments, well, where does this kind of, of polity, like Nazi Germany, that is prepared to do what was unthinkable before, carry out, at least before the 20th century, to carry out mass murder in the name of the advancement of a state. Yes, we'd already had the Armenian genocide uh, with the Turkish state in crisis, the Young Turk government trying to put it back together, uh, trying to uh, strengthen it, seeing Armenians as an enemy, as an impediment to that process, and, our, and thinking they had to do something against the Armenians. But the Nazis do this on a great scale. The Soviet Union. The Soviet leadership argues, of course, peasants who resist the collectivization, Ukrainian nationalists who oppose the whole Soviet experiment. Uh, if they stand in the way, then they must be starved out, or they must be sent east to the Euros. Let them die. Okay? There's for predecessors to this. Where is this coming from? Well, Tim rejects the notion of an overweening state. Uh, he would never accept arguments for the high modern state, uh, which uh, some argue is the outgrowth of a progressive rationalization of, of state entities and the adoption of ever more powerful nationalist ideologies to justify their ever greater power. And you can critique this from the left or the right. And I appreciate his, his critiques of the right-wing or left-wing arguments about the overweening state. But even if the Soviet state doesn't really qualify in those categories, at least I don't think so, and the Nazi state certainly doesn't, nonetheless, they both represent, they, and if you like, the Khmer Rouge uh, uh, polity, represent political entities, either controlling states or trying to build states of their own in the name of advancing a national cause or a class, cause of, of, the, of the mass working masses in ways that had been unthinkable before the 20th century. Helmut Walser Smith, a noted historian of modern Germany, has argued, well, there's a long tradition of eliminationist anti-Semitism in German history, memories of medieval expulsions. I'm not so sure that those help us understand Nazi Germany, that those memories were alive in the collective consciousness. But he gets to the late 19th century and he says, well, it turns from an eliminationist anti-Semitism to a racist anti a, a, a eliminationist racism. Uh, but then the unthinkable, ha what was unthinkable before, elimination before meant excluding from the society, expelling them, as in the medieval expulsions. Something happens in the 20th century where elimination means mass murder. How do we explain how that's done, how that's possible? Tim's got his arguments. I'm not fully satisfied yet. I think we still need to do something to explain how it is that 20th century states arrogated to themselves the authority and the power and the justification to engage in massive projects of ethnic cleansing and mass murder, claiming that that was a proper and justifiable, indeed legitimate, thing to do. You don't need enlightenment rationalism going crazy uh, to, to find an argument to understand the connections of all of those cases. And this conference tomorrow will investigate what comparisons are possible and may help us understand these multiple incidents of ethnic cleansing and genocide. Thanks for your attention.
noted, we would spend, well, I estimate we'll get out of here at 6 a.m., but I'm not sure breakfast will be served. Uh, so we, we will have to be selective. And I, um, I try to, to organize a little bit some of the parts. And please accept our apologies if your question will not, will not uh, come to bear. Um, is this all right, uh, Tim, if I just, or do you want to respond to, to what Gary said first, or how, how do you? I'll, I'll, I'll just work it into the responses. Okay, very good. And I think you should tell the audience how much longer we're going to go, in fairness to them. That is a very good point. Uh, it is, we started at 7 o'clock. It is now 8.30, so we've been going for an hour and a half. Can you bear another 20 minutes? If that sounds about right, so maybe uh, a good 20 minutes also okay. out of respect for our speaker. Um, question, uh, maybe I'll pass it to you. I'll give you only readable ones, Tim, and please you read it and, and respond. No, the other side, the handwritten. Okay. okay. So the, the question reads, Soviet Union under Stalin had organized the Holodomor, the mass political famine in Ukraine, 1932 to 1933, circa 10 years before World War II. Do you think the approach of Stalin had an influence on the Holocaust? Did the Holodomor cause the Holocaust? N not, I think there's an important relationship between the two. And I, 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 it's one of these cases where I'm, just dr I'm struck by absences. I mean, g given that Hitler was concerned with Lebensraum in Ukraine, and given that Stalin was also concerned about building the industrial Soviet Union by extracting a surplus from Ukraine, it seems like that when we write histories of the Holocaust, we should at least put that out there and consider what relationship there, there might be. And in my view, there, there are relationships, although they're not nearly as direct as this. Um, as I see it, the, the, the main relationship that one ought to discuss, even if only writing it from the German point of view, is between modernization and demodernization, where what the Soviet what the Soviet regime was up to was trying to modernize itself extremely quickly, build industry and cities by extracting coercively from the Soviet countryside, which meant above all the Soviet countryside from which there was something to extract, which meant above all U Ukraine. Hitler's notion of what to do, as I've already tried to stress, had the same geographical center. The German, Hitler also wanted the, wanted the colony, which was Ukraine, but the, the larger idea which Gary and I both mentioned, was what I'm now call demodernization, that all this Soviet industry and all these Soviet cities, they were worthless. All that really mattered was the territory and, and the food. So, I mean, Hitler does not look at the Holodomor and say this is something which is possible. He does look at the Soviet project and say this is fragile and can be undone. Now, there is a slightly more direct relationship, although it's not as, isn't as big as the one suggested here, and it has to do with the collective farm. The, 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 not Hitler personally, who to my knowledge didn't talk about collectivization this way, but German planners going into 19, the invasion of 1941 had a debate about whether they should keep the collective farm or not. And those on the political side of things said we should get rid of the collective farm because that will make us more popular. Those who were thinking about extracting resources said no, we must keep the collective farm. And they did. So the, the German planning for how to extract resources from so, the Soviet Union depended upon the Soviet institution of the collective farm, which the Germans intended to preserve. So there, there are relationships of that kind. And of course, there are also relationships of a personal kind. So um, some of the Jews, some of, the, some of our source material on the Holodomor comes from Jewish survivors of the Holocaust, who when they are recounting their early life in Ukraine, talk about the famine, right? Um, the, usually their questioners have no idea what they're talking about, but nevertheless, that's, the source material is there. So there are those kinds of connections. There is a question, uh, since this is the Ornessian lecture, the Armenian case is, is raised in a, a couple of cards. I want to read this one. I note your use, use of terminology, ethnic cleansing and mass killing in reference to, among other places, Rwanda and the Balkans at the end of the Ottoman Empire with reference to Armenians. As you know, the use or not of the word genocide is laden and important to many, especially in the case of the Armenian genocide, the Turkish state's historical and current denial of it. What are your thoughts on this, why say Armenian genocide or not? Um, 
So this is going to use up a lot of the time that we have left. I'll try, I'll try. <laughs> yeah, I'll try. I'll try. No, it's just, so in the whole. So it, in my, I wrote a book called Bloodlands, which is about 14 million people being killed, and I didn't use the word genocide. I didn't use the word genocide not because I was trying to trivialize the 14 million people being killed. I didn't use the word genocide because I think using the word genocide generally leads to misunderstanding in scholarly context. So I'll just like, I'll toss that out and then everyone else can discuss it tomorrow. But essentially there are, there are two definitions of genocide and it's impossible to get one of them, to, get, to, to, to reduce it to one. There's the legal definition which is extremely broad, and which, which goes down to and includes things such as educating children in a language which is not their own against the wishes of their parents. And then there is the sort of everyday colloquial definition of genocide, which is killing every man, woman, and child, which of course is genocide, but that's a very specific case of genocide. And the closest thing to that is the Holocaust. The problem with the use of the word genocide is that if you ask me, is, is, is Armenia, if you, let's just change the subject, is the Ukrainian Holodomor genocide? Yes, in my view it is. In my view it meets the criteria of the law of genocide of, of, of 1948, the convention. It, it meets the, the ideas that, that Rafael Lemkin laid down. Fine, yes, it's genocide. Is, is Armenia genocide? Yes, I believe legally it very easily meets that qualification. I just don't think that means what people think it means because there are people who hear the word genocide and they think it means the attempt to kill every man, woman, and, and child. And the Armenian genocide is closer to the Holocaust than most other cases. Right? But it's not the same thing. So I hesitate to use genocide because I think every time the word genocide is used, it provokes misunderstanding and, and it doesn't actually provoke understanding. So if you're gonna ask me like, legally was Armenia genocide? Yeah, of course it was. Of course it was, e it easily meets that threshold. But part of the problem is, it's much worse than the legal definition of genocide. You see, like that's one, like, and th there are things that happen that are awful so, so what happened in Armenia, to Armenians was much worse than the legal defin definition of genocide. But on the other hand, there are horrifyingly awful things that involve millions of deaths which aren't genocide. And I would hate to think that because you can't call them genocide, we therefore don't recognize them. So I find it to be, a t while I completely understand why Armenians would want for the, the events that refer to them to be called genocide, just as I understand why Ukrainians would want Holodomor to be qualified as genocide. While I understand that in certain contexts I would defend it, as a scholar I don't use the word because as a scholar I think in scholarly discussions it just generates confusion. Thank you so much, Tim. I take you up on your word. The first sentence in your little book uh, is, history does not repeat, but it does instruct and there are quite a number of cards, maybe not surprising in the current American situation, which is so far removed from anything that you discuss. Uh, but there are references to the ideas of some ideologues about the destruction of the administrative state. And people would like uh, you to speak to that. There's also a related question, maybe, which I think would be worth addressing to prevent the last um, prevent the last minute here in the United States, would you suggest a particular institution to strengthen? So what about the destruction of the administrative state? How does it relate to the destruction of the state that you talked about? And are there institutions that you think are particularly important for us to pay attention to? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a slight cop out on that question and just say that I wrote a very, very short um, and almost coercively inexpensive book um, about that. And I, 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 I have 20 ideas about what one should do to support civil and political society in the United States. I'm not gonna recite them all, all here. I'm just gonna comment briefly on this business of the state um, and about the 1930s. One of the, pro one of the problematic myths of the United States, and Gary kindly referred to it, um, is, is the notion that the state can only do ill. So, our notion of freedom is the lone individual against the state. And I mean, that's a ridiculous notion. If you're a lone of individual against the state, you're finished. There, you're, there's no way you can resist it. Even the pathetic, like, interwar, you're not, you don't have a chance. It's a myth, it's a story, it's Ayn Rand, it's not real, right? Um, the, the, and, and you wouldn't even be there having that myth if the state hadn't given you education and, you know, it, it, it's, it's, you wouldn't be reading Ayn Rand, you know, if, like, if some nice elementary school paid by your parents' taxes hadn't taught you to read English. Um, so it, it, th that's just the way we think about the state is comical, and it's okay to be, it's okay for it to be comical when there's no real threat. But then sometimes there is. I mean, it's not okay. I mean, it causes problems. We should have you know the, our state should work better and be more just. But it, m most of the time, it doesn't cause it. 
it's, it's not risking our existence as a society. Right now it is. Um, because if you, if you seriously think that what needs to happen in America is the destruction of the administrative state, I mean, if that means what I, what I think it means, it's not going to be then a whole lot of heroic individuals um, you know, fighting for their freedom. It's going to be blood on the streets like Europe in, in the 1940s if you get rid of the federal government. We're not any better than these people. I mean, that, this is not really the lines along which my talk went. But if you, but, and, and you know, I, 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 I agree with a lot of what Gary said. I think most of us who work on the Holocaust, although we would disagree about the terminology, would agree with some version of the claim that institutions are important. Some of us look more at how institutions changed in Germany in 1933 and how behavior changed. I, I think that's marvelous work. It's not what I do, but I think it's marvelous. I'm trying to extend that case by looking at what happens when you actually just wrench institutions away or alter them radically. But I think most of us would agree with some version of the argument of institutions matter. And if you think institutions matter, then it follows that getting rid of institutions or fantasizing about getting rid of institutions is a rather dangerous way of fantasizing. And with, you know, with Mr. Bannon, who's the author of that phrase, in general, what I find striking is the way that his nostalgia is not a conservative. So an American conservative has nostalgia uh, is thinking about the 1950s. You can correct me, you know, if you're conservatives out there, you can tell me, you know, maybe it's the sick, I don't know. But it's not the 70s, um, it's the 50s. And the 50s are interesting because, okay, so in the 50s you don't have the Civil Rights Act yet. There's not big immigration yet. But in the 50s we have fought the Second World War and we do have the beginnings of a welfare state. And that's really important. If you go from the 50s back to the 30s, as Mr. Bannon instructs us to do for your golden age, you're looking at an America which doesn't have a welfare state. And also, you're looking at an America which doesn't enter the Second World War, which is why they couldn't do Holocaust Remembrance Day, because that's not their myth. That's not their story about America. But we did have the GI Bill. We had the GI Bill. We had the Interstate Highway Act, perhaps the single yep. most important accomplishment of the Eisenhower administration that he wanted that the integration of public schools in segregated areas was not his goal, but it happened. And so there's, you know, again, institutions matter. Uh, the, the conservatives uh, of, Ban well, Bannon is not a conservative, uh, but we're, he's not talking about the dismantling of the state in total, those parts of it uh, uh, that he objects to. Similarly, in your argument about Hitler, he wants to remove the restrictions of the liberal state of, based on law, the Reichstag, uh, but he wants to use the institutions, he's going to add institutions yeah. to help unemployed people, to create a labor service, to expand the military, to build the Autobahn, and, you know, there's this long list of things that a more powerful, effective German government that's going to make Germany great again, that's going to unite Germans as opposed to this republic that divided them, you know the rhetoric. Uh, so he does not come to power or even launch his regime to dismantle the German state, but to transform it in okay. a certain direction. Yeah, so here, here, I am, here I'm going to say something. So I never say that Hitler destroys the German state or wants to. What I say is that Hitler transforms the German state into an instrument for the destruction of other states. And by, by this I mean to change the discussion because what, what, the, what the Holocaust wasn't was a German state killing its own citizens on its own territory basically didn't happen. The big exception is not the Holocaust, but the euthanasia program. What the Holocaust is, is the German state transforming itself in the 1930s into an instrument which can destroy other states, which, which is an ideal type, right? There's a range of behavior which I'm trying to capture under the ideal type. But that's not, such that the Holocaust can happen beyond the German state. So it's, of course, not the case that Germany self-destructed. Germany altered itself so that Germany could destroy other states. An America which doesn't have the rule of law, but which has a huge army, I agree, is, is still a state. But America, which doesn't have the rule of law and has a huge army, is probably going to be wreaking havoc somewhere else pretty soon. Uh, I will read two more questions, and then we will call it a day in this room anyway, and there will be more of a day in the, uh, in the reception room. One question deals with the past, one deals with the future. The question dealing with the past deals with the American past specifically, and there are quite a number of students and colleagues who are concerned with Native American issues, and so I'm going to read this one. How would you compare the Holocaust with the genocide of the indigenous people of the Americas based on the divine exceptionalism of white European um, 
make Christian supremacy that give, gives, gave legitimacy to taking the land of indigenous peoples. Uh, you want to comment on that? Sure. So I'm not being a specialist on U.S. history. I will comment on that from, the, from inside the Hitlerian worldview. So from Hitler's point of view, the, 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 the comparison would not be the Jews and the American Indians. The comparison would be the Ukrainians or the, or the Russians. Hitler looked at America as a model frontier empire. Hitler thought that America had shown how it can be done, and the only problem was to do it in a few years rather than a few decades. So when Hitler talks about America, um, what he does is he makes comparisons between, for example, the Red Army and Indian Army, which was just, that was not a useful strategic comparison for him, interestingly. But he said, you know, when he, when he, in, his, in the many moments where he said that the Red Army would collapse, he said, you know, they will fight like Indians with the same result. Um, so the, his, his vision is something like Ukraine, I mean, I don't want to push it too far, but he sees America as a frontier empire, and Germany should do the same thing that America did. In this scheme, the Indians are not the Jews. The Jews are the same, the Jews are the Jews all over the world. In this scheme, the, the Indians are the inferior race that's to be mastered, starved, um, moved around, like, as he saw the Slavs in, in Eastern Europe. The final question, and I'm sorry I don't end up light to know, do you foresee future genocides? If so, where, when? Story. You don't have to predict. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, well, I, you have a theory, right? And your theory uh, contains variables that might allow themselves, sorry, to speak social science language for predictive yeah. purposes. I think, I, I think it's, I think it is useful to have in mind causal factors. I think it's useful to, to consider past cases of of ethnic cleansing, mass murder, or if you prefer, genocide, as illustrative of of, of certain kinds of of general general connections of causes, I think that's, I think that's useful. Um, and I'm not the only one who thinks that. There are plenty of institutions, including the US government, that are trying to predict genocides based upon that, what we think we understand about genocides in the past. And so whether we want to or not, as our interpretations, our scholarly interpretations of mass killing change, the predictive apparatus of institutions change along with us because they're using our articles and they're using our data to try to make predictions right, right now as, as, as we speak. So there's, a, there's an inevitable connection whether I want there to be or, or not. My, I will tell you simply again what worries me the most. What, what worries me on a local scale is global warming. It worries me that the places most affected by global warming are almost entirely Muslim. That worries me. It worries me that global warming is associated with the collapse of states as well as competition for resources. It worries me that Muslims would be perfectly reasonable in saying that they didn't bring global warming about because with the exception of the Saudis, essentially they haven't, whereas we have. It's, a, it's, not, it's not reasonable for an individual Muslim in Pakistan or Indonesia um, to, to blame you for floods or an individual M Muslim in Egypt or, um, or, or Libya to blame you for the fact that the dry season is going to triple in length, but it's not entirely, it wouldn't be entirely uh, unreasonable I, either, right? That, I, that worries me a lot, that combination of um, conflicts that are already underway with worsening climatic conditions and probable state collapse. That worries me a lot. What worries me the most is the possibility of major states. And I, I want to try to be neutral about this, you know, like Russia, like China, like the United States, states that can project power, projecting it with goals of destroying other states animated by some kind of ideology, motivated by some kind of ecological panic. I don't see any of those things lining up and all three of those things lining up in all three of the states, but that's the thing which I would most look out for in the future, um, to, for something greater than a local episode of mass killing. Thank you very much, Tim. I would like to thank, uh, again, the late Archon Ornessian for making this possible in the Ornessian Fund. Uh, I would like to thank Eric Horn for his comments and most particularly tonight, Timothy Snyder for his uh, lecture and his responses. And thank you all for Thank you.